Thanks everybody for uh, attending this, uh, the um, uh, fall 2023 uh, PTI seminar speaker series. We are very pleased to have Dr. Beth Woods join us today. Um, she has a PhD from the University of Georgia in learning design and technology. Um, she is the director for the University of Georgia uh, for research and computational data management. So these are all topics that are near and dear to many of our hearts here in the room, virtually and, and also in person. Uh, this is a new role that she's taken on, I believe starting in May. April. April, okay. Um, so it's a new unit at the University of Georgia um, focused on building out research data management support and services. Um, so that's a really awesome place to be um, to get to shape the, the future of research data management at the institution. Um, so today she's going to give us a talk about building and sustaining research data services in a changing policy landscape. Um, and I am so very thankful that she has agreed to come and speak with us. Um, so I believe that she has a bunch of slides, but would really prefer that this be kind of an interactive um, uh, session. So um, Robert will be monitoring the um, uh, chat, the Zoom chat session, but I guess we should discuss how would you prefer that people um, interact? Just raise a hand. Yeah, that's fine. It's, uh, I don't always know where the voice is coming from, so just shoot up a hand and you have a question. Great. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Leave it to you. Thank you all so much. You all have been very gracious in hosting me here at Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, so I, I met Beth and I met Aaron um, at an RDA US meeting in May. Um, I had been uh, kind of shuffled. My boss said, hey, go up to this meeting and just go meet people and talk about what we're doing and go listen and learn um, because this is a new field for me. Um, I had worked at the University of Georgia for about 15, 16 years now. Um, the last eight, I was the executive director for IT of our College of Arts and Sciences, um, working with researchers, but we also had a much larger portfolio than that. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the University of Georgia. There are some key similarities and key differences <laughs> that I think are important to understand, um, but hopefully we can uh, learn with each other today and ask questions and hopefully move this um, process forward at both of our respective institutions and helping our researchers with data management and research data services more broadly. Um, so they invited me to talk to you a little bit about the research landscape and what we're doing at the University of Georgia. And I keep forgetting I have two screens, my apologies. They go there. On this gloomy day, I thought I would share a very springy um, photo. This is our main library. This is where my office is located. Um, so it's a new office, a new title uh, within the libraries. Um, I took a non-traditional path to get there. Um, I joined the university, like I said, in 2008. Um, I pr primarily served in IT roles, um, and I had an instructional technology background um, I, and worked on the client-facing roles and web services roles. Um, so my interaction with research data up until about 2015 was really limited to integrating technology, the research that was happening in the labs into their curriculum and the technology integration. So I always really liked what was happening in the research space, but I didn't have a lot of interaction. When I became the executive director in 2015, that's when I had to dive full head into what was happening at the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. Um, we are a highly decentralized organization. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that more when we get to some of the research data management committee work and task forces and eventually our council. Um, but for context, we ran at the college, we had over 300 classrooms we were responsible for. We ran all of the department um, and center and institute websites. Um, at the college level, we provided all the client support at the college level, and then all the research, almost all the research was happening at the lab level. So we were trying to offer centralized services at the college level that did not duplicate what was happening at the institution IT level, but we are not nearly as advanced as you all are in terms of research computing services, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so I, I inherited a model that was not functioning very well. Um, I spent those eight years really trying to work with faculty, work with our IT team to develop at least some services that made sense in the context in which we operated. Um, I didn't love that we were having to run research services at a college level. I didn't ultimately feel like it was a great solution. It didn't serve our faculty well, particularly in a highly interdisciplinary research realm. Um, and so there are some real advantages to creating these services centrally. And so we can go back and forth and talk about it. 
Um, so I thought I would start off really quickly with a, a snapshot of who we are and to give you kind of some orientation the comparators between Indiana University and the University of Georgia. We are very similar to you all. We were founded in 1785. We are a land and sea grant institution. Um, so we have a big coastal region. We do a lot with um, fishing and farming. Um, so I started to put a, a tractor picture in here. I didn't put that because I figured you will have plenty of tractors in Indiana. <laughs> Um, but I did, I, I dropped the oyster, um, the oyster study picture in, in favor of putting my uh, colleague, Marianne Moran, who works in marine sciences. She's an amazing researcher at our institution. Um, we are about 70 miles northeast of downtown Atlanta. We serve about 30,000 undergraduate students, about 8,300 graduate students, and then we have about 1,600 um, professional students that are in our like veterinary college, our law school, um, pharmacy school, etc. We do not have a medical college, um, and we only recently have a college of engineering. So um, we can't compete with an institution that is very well known about 70 miles southwest of us um, <laughs> um, in that space, but we are uh, growing our engineering um, college. It is growing rapidly. Um, we are starting to see our toe dip. We we'll talked about this with the research group today in CUI controlled unclassified information studies. Um, there's big pressure to, to start working in the DOD space, um, to start, and we even think some of the Department of Education is going to have some of that CUI compliance coming in, and we're working actively to address some of that. Um, we have over um, 10,800 um, employees, about um, 3,000 of those are faculty. Um, our research R&D is similar to Indiana University. Um, so in FY22, um, we did 545.6 million. Um, we have a $7.6 billion impact on the state. Um, so it's the work that we do at, at the University of Georgia is really critical to the you know, to the, um, to the state. Um, we are one of the top five universities in innovation and bringing products to market. So um, we, have, we have over 900 products that are produced by our researchers that have been actually produced and, and are actively. You've seen those for stasis commercials, for example, the eye drops that came out of our veterinary college at one point in time. Um, we also have a fairly large footprint. Um, the, the Athens campus is only 72 acres. We have over 465 buildings on that physical campus space, but we occupy about almost 40,000 acres across the state um, and across 31 out of the 159 counties in the state of Georgia. Um, when I moved to Georgia, I was like, you guys have 159 counties. I'm never going to pass that quiz. <laughs> Don't ask me which ones. <laughs> um, and we have 18 colleges and schools. Um, so similar in lots of ways, different in lots of ways. Um, so in terms of the landscape, what's happening right now, when I talk to our faculty and talk to our IT folks, talk to our librarians, um, I'm trying to help them understand some of the key um, pieces that are happening right now in the, in the policy landscape. And what we're seeing right now is a change in research compliance. And I'm sure those of you who are working in the library space and those of you who are working in the IT space are very keenly aware of this. Some pockets of our faculty are aware of this, particularly those that are working in NIH grants where there are new requirements are aware of this. But many of our faculty are still not really aware of what's happening. So um, in 2013, there was an OSTP memo called the Holdren Memo that was really the first toe dip into open publishing, open scholarship, sharing of research, um, sharing science openly, um, getting that information out there to the public to help facilitate innovation, um, facilitate business and industry, help facilitate more research and, and expedite research. Um, and then in, in FY22, um, or August of 22, the OSTP released a new memo called the Nelson Memo that said, nope, we're really going to do this. Um, and here's how we're going to do it. And that memo is really talking to the funding agencies but it has real implications for researchers. And what that memo is really getting at is telling those funding agencies, hey, no, lumber, no later than December 31st of 2025, you need to update your public access policies for your researchers and set expectations. You need to establish transparent procedures to ensure scientific and research integrity is maintained, and you need to coordinate with the OSTP to ensure the equitable delivery of federally funded research results and data. That's a big deal. It's basically saying, hey, we're really going to do this and we're going to do this across the board. Um, and many of the funding agencies are kind of in different places with respect to that. But they really took the lead of the NIH in how they phrased that memo. At the same time, and this is where our IT folks are probably going to go, ooh. Um, 
There we go. <laughs> uh, the federal uh, administration is um, taking a critical eye to information security. So at the same time we're making all of this information open and public, information security requirements are real. There's a real threat to research data. There's a real threat to institutions and protecting things like intellectual property, protecting copyright, making sure that we're um, keeping uh, personal information um, secure and protected. So they're really looking at um, guidance in the NSP-33 memo, um, which is really about guidance for securing your, your data. Um, the CMMC is going to be the group that's um, setting the, the auditing protocol, um, and they're working with the NIST standards on what you have to meet to meet compliance. So those of you all who write inf information security and research folks, are there anybody in this room? Couple? Okay. Um, so those folks are really kind of, if you're on the, the different working groups, they're really sweating bullets right now because there are new, there's new NIST um, standards that researchers have to meet with respect to um, CUI, that controlled unclassified information. If you're doing a study, there's over a hundred unique um, criteria that you have to meet um, to maintain compliance. Um, it's very intensive. And then the CMMC at some point will set the protocol on how institutions are audited and that they're out of sync with each other. <laughs> we'll talk about that. So in January of 2024, um, we've already got this revision three of the, this protocol. This is the um, criteria with which um, controlled and classified information is um, to be evaluated. The guidelines, we're expecting to see the CMMC put some of the language around um, following NIST revision three, uh, 800 revision three in grants in Q1. And if you don't have that infrastructure in place, it's, it's really problematic. You, it's not geared for a physical facility per se. Um, so if you don't have a virtual infrastructure that's ready to go with respect to that, it can be really challenging for those institutions. And the needle keeps moving a little bit. So we're expecting to see some of that information security piece come into play. At the end of 2024, we've got a little more breathing room on the OSTP deadline for agencies about publishing their public access policies. At the end of that year, we should see those public access policies kind of available and know what we're really supposed to be targeting. So right now in the interim, we're having to meet these security requirements. We're having to plan for open sharing, but we're not quite sure how all these agencies are going to bring this together in the end. Um, so in 2025, we're expecting a three-year rollout um, where these revisions, this public comment will end. Um, you can see this um, information security auditing component will come in and roll out over three years. And then in 2026, in Q1, you can see the compliance for open publishing to take effect. So how will this impact our researchers? Um, so we're, we're really looking to the NIH, which is the only funding agency. NSF has kind of published some things, but they're still getting public comment and what have you. But NIH is really the group that we're looking to right now. Um, but And what it looks like is that faculty will be expected to create and share, create and maintain data management and sharing plans for their research. So what data do you intend to collect? How much data do you intend, intend to collect? Where will you put it? Where will you share it, make it available? Um, you're expected to publish peer-reviewed scholarly publications and data and agency design designated and open access repositories. There are real questions, at least at our institution, of how much data do we want to retain or what data should we retain at the institution level, or do we just, will it all go to these agencies? And then the third is having uh, providing metadata for public access. We usually talk in the library world around fair principles, so findable, accessible, I'm in a library room. In the wrong Interoperable, does anyone know the last one? Reusable. Reusable, there you go. And so um, thinking about how you can make that, um, tagging that data, the metadata, making it available to people, the process and workflows, and when do you apply that metadata? So when someone's actively working on their, their grant, do you have data stewards and data curators that are working with researchers to actively tag that data um, so that when it's the project is done, it's a fairly swift ingest, or do you just kind of wait till the end and let them figure it out? <laughs> There's a little bit of a researcher push pull there. So if, yes. if I may, yeah, so the, um, 
Okay, so you know, I was the I was I was at the National Science Foundation working in open science under the Holdren memo for, for several years. So yeah, and then you know, the 17 to, to 20. Um, one of the discussions that we had was um, data in you know open access repositories at the end of the grant versus at the moment of paper submission, you know, which is a huge difference yeah. with respect to how you take advantage of and, and publish on the data that you've collected. Exactly. So has that, you know, has has have has there been clarity on that? Uh, no, it, you know, in terms of for, when that data needs to be right. made available more open. Yeah, so we have, I will speak from the University of Georgia perspective on this first, and then I'll go back to what I've seen in other institutions. Mm -hmm. There are different institutions that are taking different approaches to that. Some of them, and the model that I particularly gravitate toward, I like, we're hiring a research data management coordinator like a lot of institutions are. It's a position that's dedicated just to helping faculty with this piece and this piece in particular, we already have a scholarly communications, scholarly publications librarian um, that's working with it on the peer reviewed side and publishing that in our repositories or with our journals that we have agreements with. Um, what what I the model that I particularly like it's having a um, a training model where you have somebody who is the the, the person who is um, knowledgeable about that process that they work to develop templates around um, the, the various funding agencies and work with particular centers and institutes that are um, that are going to be working with funding agencies comment like again and again. So if you know a center is typically working with the NIH having a template for that center that they can use cross training data stewards within. So it could be a graduate student, for example, that's res responsible for data management um, on the grant and that they work with them to go ahead and create the metadata while they're working through that study. So as they go along, they're generating the meta metadata with what will be the output that then gets published and shared so that they're not having to scramble at the end. Is it realistic? I don't know. We've never had anything like this before at the University of Georgia. What we have right now is everything is at the end and it's a bit of a scramble and it depends on the researcher. Some researchers are really well, well organized. Other researchers will have literally shown up with a laptop and a box of hard disks and said, can you preserve my data? That's a tough conversation to have. <laughs> um, so I, I think my personal preference um, would be the former, which is to work with the research and researchers in lockstep where you are um, a developing a training model that you're reaching out to people who are working actively in the grant to develop a, a, a template and um, a process by which they generate the metadata. Thank you. Huh? Okay. I think, I mean, to, to add, that, add to that and back to Beth's question, I think that, the, correct me if I'm wrong, the OST, the, the Nelson memo, references data being available at time of publication, right? That, so yes. I think that is the expectation that the agency policy will, yes. will follow that. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, I was trying to pull, think of the NIH, but the NIH says, I think it's, Not I think sure. it's at the time of publication. I think it, it mirrors that. That's where, that was my hesitation. I couldn't remember if it was in the Nelson memo or if it's in the NIH. If I may, just because mm -hmm. you said this could be interactive, yep. but then what that means is you're going to get only the data associated with that publication and as small amount of it as possible because you're going to try mm -hmm. to hold on to the bulk of it so you can continue to take advantage of it. Yeah, so it has disadvantages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's going to fragment basically collections is basically what it's going to do. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, so the impact on the in institution continued. So where we are at UGA, you know, as I, I mentioned, we are we are highly decentralized, but we are we are and have been working for, for several years um, to find some sort of workflow and unification between the policy um, that's expected from uh, federal policy, but also institutional policies um, where we have gaps or where we need to bolster what we're doing, um, making sure that we have appropriate infrastructure in place. This is where I think there's a big difference between IU and the University of Georgia and then support services. And I think there are pockets where um, I think we're we are probably behind you all on support services in some areas and, and areas where we can work together to, to look at what works well um, and, and build off of each other. Um, so before, before I go into where we are, I think it's important, again, going back to how we're a little bit different and probably a little behind in some areas. Um, we really started talking about research data management pretty late in the game. 
Um, so in 2015, um, as I mentioned, institutions highly decentralized, research was taking place at the departments, the early efforts to centralize IT failed, in my opinion. Um, we we got, went from departments to college level IT. We still have colleges that have departmental IT. We still have research that's taking place largely at the lab level. There are people, there is a centralized high performance computing cluster that is used um, extensively by a subset of faculty members across the campus, but the bulk of the researchers are not using the HPC cluster at the University of Georgia. So what the challenge that we were dealing with at that time was how we prevent data loss. <laughs> so that's your foundation of research data management, which is um, a big gap. So our central IT um, was focused on campus-wide services. We were really working with the administrative systems, your financial systems, your learning management systems. The only research computing ex extensively that they were providing was HBC, um, high-performance computing. Um, and then the network was a component of that. Um, I inherited a partially decentralized IT unit in 2015. Um, most of our researchers, as I mentioned, didn't use that. We were really trying to push the needle on it and try and find some sort of solution. When you try and organize a group that includes um, members of college leadership, I libraries, IT, both from the central units and the college level units, um, where we landed was the Office of Research just kind of said, we're, we're setting, you know, they hit charge this committee. Okay, we're, this is where we're going to end up on this. This is all we can kind of move the needle on at this point. What they landed on was research institutional file storage, which we uh, dubbed RIPS, which is an unfortunate name or acronym for it. <laughs> um, but it's, 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 you know, sensibly, it's to replace the external hard drives on the desk. Um, it is highly subsidized by the uh, university. It is still a cost recovery system. Faculty did not like that they had to pay for it. It was intended to provide, this is where our librarians will cringe, archival support for research. It is not true archive, it is a backup. They didn't use it as that. They used it as file sharing at a cheap cost <laughs> where they invested in it. The people who really needed it the most didn't have the funding to pay for it and didn't use it and still lost data anyway. Um, and so um, we really, the, the kind of last ditch effort that I threw into that, that committee was, hey, can we at least take an educational approach to this? Um, and they said, yeah, go ahead and, and, and figure this out and see what you can come up with. So um, I worked with colleagues um, to put together what was researchit.ug.edu, now redirects to some crazy URL still exists, but it was a, at least a one-stop shop for new faculty in particular. They're coming to the University of Georgia to have one single point that they could land on to find out what research IT services were available from these various units. So it helped to differentiate what was available from central IT, what they could get from college IT, or when they should ask their college IT to see if there was a better option for their research needs, and then what services were available at the libraries. So fast forward to, I'm trying to remember what year we started on this one. We went from a committee to a task force. Um, and this was uh, about the time that our, our current provost um, came to the university. I wanna say, do you remember, what year did Pam Witten come here? Do you all know? <laughs> so probably 20, yeah, so we finished this report in 2020. So it was probably 2019 was when this task force was formed under the new provost. Um, and so the associate vice provost and university librarian, Toby Graham, charged this. He was basically, the provost was like, what, you know, he, Toby approached um, provost two and said, you know, what can the libraries do to support um, you and your new role and support the university? He was like, listen, come up with some sort of strategic roadmap to enhance research data management capabilities at the University of Georgia. So again, a task force was made up of Office of Research personnel, college faculty. Um, so that was a big difference. We wanted to make sure we included faculty researchers, particularly those who were generating a good um, substantial data that would have uh, want to have say into what was happening. Um, libraries, central and college level IT, and we also work with a consultant. And that was actually really critical. What the output of that group was, um, we surveyed faculty. It was actually a pretty broad survey. I was really surprised with how many Faculty actually responded. That's half the battle sometimes. Um, but we got a, a good chunk of faculty uh, response to our surveys. 
We conducted focus groups with our IT leadership. So again, that distributed IT groups, what were the challenges that they were facing with respect to research data? Um, what could be, um, what needed to be improved? What ideas did they have? That was really generative. And then we looked at peer and aspirant benchmarking. So what were other libraries offering with respect to scho um, digital scholarship, data services, what this looked like? We published this report in October of 2020. So um, I think it's important that we all live through 2020. Um, so that was a really tough time. We actually kind of stopped the project in March, like the rest of the world and came back to it. And um, I was really pleased with what the output was despite the challenges that we were facing during that time, having to roll out, I don't know if you all did this high flex technology and every, we didn't have video cameras in a lot of classrooms. So um, there was a lot of work happening to realistically help classes while also helping um, move this forward. So it came out with a two phase approach, which was to establish a, a definition around research data management, establish what they call the steering committee, um, designate an RDM coordinator that works across divisions. So not, it could be positioned in one unit, whether it was IT or the research, office of research or the libraries or somewhere else, um, but that it was an expectation that they work across all of those groups. Um, the expectation was to expand research data management services and support tools um, to uh, support open science initiative and create communities of practice and gather baseline data. And then it had a phase two. A lot of phase two is really based on the outcomes of what was generated in that baseline data. Um, but um, again, facilitating more connections across campus, deepening those connections. So um, I, I remember looking at Kobe and saying, listen, you're looking for a unicorn in this position. Um, you're going to have a hard time finding a faculty member that's uh, you know, going to leave tenure to come do this. You're going to have a hard time finding somebody who's knowledgeable about technology um, that can step into this into a library's role, um, can talk to researchers, what have you. And it ended up sort of hitting at a time that was um, really fortuitous and ended up stepping into the role. I think that phase two approach is not, they have designated that for 12 to 24 months. That's really, having been in this role for about eight months now, I think it's really aspirational for being realistic. Nonetheless, um, we did establish the steering council, or steering committee became an advisory council. Um, the provost is taking up the charge with it. So he, uh, he charged the, the council. Um, we advised the provost's office. So I, you know, I report to the libraries, but I'm responsible for meeting the expectations of the office of the provost and our team is. Um, we work with the vice president for research and the vice president for IT on the life cycle of activities related to research data, including policy um, and planning for all aspects of data management that's coming from our definition um, that we, we generated. The members represent key stakeholders. Um, it's largely uh, mirrors the group that was before. So we had Office of Research, we have libraries, we have IT. We don't have college level IT in this council at this point. So that's shifted out. We have added additional faculty members to it. Um, so that is one significant difference that is creating some pinch points because of our decentralized environment. But ultimately I think it's what's needed um, moving forward. Um, we have a research data at edu.edu that's really just a placeholder site at this point for the council, but the expectation is that that will be the landing place for faculty to come to for information about research data services. So our, our charge is really to address requirements from funding agencies, publishers, and data providers, identify needs, develop policies, workflows, and support models, and to help researchers manage and steward their data securely, effectively, and efficiently, and that's directly from our charge and from our definition. Are there any questions before I jump? This is where we are today. Any questions about the structure of this group before I jump into what we're wrestling with at the moment? All right, so we have tried to start with policy and infrastructure. And the question I keep asking our council month after month after month, what data do we want to preserve at the University of Georgia? And that is a really hard question that they're struggling with answering. So we have some clear um, expectations around things like our electronic theses and dissertations. We have clear policy around that. We have clear workflows. Publications, we've been doing that for a long time. We've had an institutional repository for many years now. Our open research data, 
you know, I think to your point, there's some nuances there, but, you know, we want to have a repository at the institution level that can support open research data, similar to what we're doing with publications um, on that space. We also have a, a, a fairly extensive special collections set of libraries um, that generate significant data. I think you all have something similar. We were talking about the, um, I've forgotten the name of the group, but the Sony. Um, oh, the, um, uh, the digitization for yeah. you know, all the. Uh, the MDPI, digitization. Media Digitization Preservation. Media Preservation, yeah. yeah. So that group is, is very, you know, I think we're doing similar work with respect to like the Peabody Awards and Brown Media. We also have the Hargret um, Special Collections and Russell Special Collections and a few other like Capitol Museum, things like that. So that we consider as collections as data and, and, and trying to make that available for people to conduct research and they want people to conduct research. Those are highly decentralized. It's probably not a high priority in terms of making it um, a unified system for them, but we do have a high priority for making sure that this is on a unified preservation system at some point. This is where the council keeps getting caught up. And I think this is true for a lot of groups. Um, what are we doing with our high performance computing data? Do we need to keep that? Do we need to have policy around that? Do we let that go? Do we wait until it becomes this open research data? Um, if they're dealing with big data, so we just had a meeting with a lab. Um, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a lab, but it's a center. Um, it's a lab within a center. They just purchased, um, I believe, five high impact um, uh, microscopes. One of those microscopes generates five terabytes of data per day. Um, they want to be able to make that data available um, outwardly to um, co-researchers at other institutions. They also want to partner with business and industry where they're doing this imaging and making it available at a cost recovery. They also want to make it available internally. They also need to retain it for a period of time. They had no plan in place for <laughs> purchasing storage um, to be able to house that. We don't have anything currently in place at the University of Georgia to do that. Um, similarly, um, dealing with sensitive or restricted data. So um, we're not really dealing with the but public health information. For example, you're dealing with HIPAA um, that controlled unclassified information. Um, it, you know, there's an expectation that the researcher maintains that data for a period of time. For grants typically it's anywhere between like three and seven years, depending on the grant, depending on what type of data it is, um, where you're putting it. And then there are researchers that just want to hold on to raw data. I might need this again in the future. I might want to continue to do something with this or might want to, to your point, I've published this piece, but I have all this other data. It might be useful to know, you know, if, I, if I, there's a new model for me to, to analyze this genetic data, I can, you know, do this all over again. <laughs> um, and so how do we maintain that in this decentralized environment? So we're a little bit stuck. So what we're trying to target right now is um, at the library level, we're working on these two pieces. So um, I talked to, I forgot who I've spoken with this morning, but we're looking at more of a unified system at this level. And I think I talked with Aaron about, we're looking at um, several different repository products. The no, DSpace is one that's big in the library's world. Um, Tend is another one, Figshare. So several of these product lines that we're looking at that are fully hosted online, um, that we can work on policy and workflow for ingest, self-publication, and then putting it in and making it available through our, our catalog. Um, we also really desperately need to replace our preservation system. Um, we are looking at a product line called Versity. Um, if you all are familiar with that. And then it has it's effectively a tape system as well that has a, um, a server layer on top, MediaFlux as well to help manage the metadata and the policy pieces on top of that. So these are the pieces that we're kind of stuck with right now and we're trying to wrestle with the council's just stuck with how do we, how much do we need to invest in this infrastructure before um, we cost ourselves out of being able to run this realistically? May I ask a question? Please. So yeah, so with the open research data, um, that could be in a community repository, it could be in a, in a federal agency repository. And for those data sets that end up there, do you want your own copy? That's a great question. So that goes back to my original question for the council. What data do we want to preserve at the University of Georgia? And when looking at other institutions, there are groups that are treating their institutional repository and their research data repository as that place of last stop. So I have unfunded research. I have foundation-based research where I'm not working with repository or there's not a generalist repository like a thick share, a dry, what have you, that really meets my audience. Um, in terms of getting my data out there to people quickly and easily, it's, it's not the right route. 
Um, there are other institutions, I talked to um, a colleague at um, Princeton, for example, and they are doing some really um, you know, interesting work. I think they're kind of midway through um, their process, but they are taking the approach of we're gonna keep everything. We've had X number of Nobel Prize winners. Um, we wanna be sure that we're prepared for the next one. Um, we want to have their data. So if somebody wants to come back and, and continue this, the work of this individual or, or kind of um, advance this further, we want to be able to make sure that's available to people. They have a very in-depth process of data curation um, on the active research side before it goes to their repository, but then they're keeping that um, and, and um, they're kind of pick, taking it all. They're also dealing, they're up for their, you know, eyeballs and many, many petabytes of data at this point. Um, and that's a piece that I think is really for our institution pretty scary. How do we, you know, how do we fund this? How do we maintain this ever-growing enclave of um, preserved data? So, um, yeah, is there more to that question, mm -hmm. Diana? No. no, I think that's the really the root question that we are we are wrestling with because what we decide here and here impacts this and this is not we're already looking at a, a project that's well over a million dollars for us um with just this right here for us is already just what we have here and here and it's over a million dollars um so we're working through that we still have a long way to go um, in terms of support services, we are a small but mighty team right now. Um, as I mentioned, this, this office did not exist previously. This is because of the, um, the slide that I show when we go to places to talk to departments and you know, it's about what it is that we do. So um, we are really focused on educational outreach to this office right now, in addition to the work of the advisory council. Um, so we're working on research data management planning and support, data discovery, data access and data collection, um, doing some of the data analysis and visualization tools uh, and, and, and outputs and then publishing copyright. So we have a GIS librarian. Um, DigiLab is our digital humanities lab that is historical. Um, we will probably rebrand that to a, a data studio in the next year or so. And scholarly communications, we're also recruiting a research data management coordinator. So I thought I would just close out on some questions um, that we're, we're really kind of wrestling with. Um, again, going back to what data do we want to preserve at the institution is the key question that we're, we're wrestling with right now. How long do we want to keep it is the other. Um, so if we decide we're going to go with, we're going to retain a copy of everything, we're going to copy somebody's or preserve somebody's big data, um, and we start gobbling up storage, um, how long are we going to preserve that storage before it becomes no longer relevant? Um, at Cliff Lynch at CNI um, <laughs> mentioned it's somewhere between five years and infinity, but nobody quite knows what that is. <laughs> I tend to agree with him on that one. Um, we've been talking a lot about what is required for storage versus what is optional. If we go with what is required, that sliver is much, much smaller for the University of Georgia, but it also has some question about relevance of the systems and the investment in the infrastructure. Um, can we scale this sustainably? That's a big challenge for us right now because that end piece, that preservation piece is really, um, financially a challenge for us. And then support services, how can we ensure that researchers feel supported in their research, particularly with the, the new um, uh, services or with the new policy requirements that we have? Um, how do we make sure that we position support services at the intersection of uh, our Office of Research, ITs and libraries long-term? Um, that's, a, that's a big component right there. And I mentioned Cliff earlier, um, you know, they, the state of open data, there was a report of state of open data um, that faculty, the bulk of faculty don't know what research data management is. Um, we are also at the libraries going through a significant shuffle with what services we provide to make sure that we're aligning with faculty needs. And then um, we are, we're just wanting to make sure that this, the relevance of this department really targets, you know, we don't want to be this middle management group. We really want to be in a position where we're supporting faculty long-term. So the example that I've been talking with people about is we have the Office of Instruction, our central IT unit for technology, and the libraries in, um, with respect to our Center for Teaching and Learning. I'd like to create an equivalent of that on the research side where we have the Office of Research, our um, central IT, our libraries, and have this Center for Research Data Services 
at the University of Georgia that makes sure that we have a buy-in and support from all three units supporting it as well. So that's it. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. Um, I think we're kind of close on time, but please feel free to ask anything. Are there any questions for the chat? Right. No, I was wondering if yeah. I didn't get anything online. Yeah. yeah. Robert, do we have no, anything? Not else? so far. Okay. okay. All right. Well, go ahead. Go for it. Um, yeah, thanks very much. This is really interesting, definitely directly relevant to a lot of what we're talking about looking at here. Um, one of the other things we've been talking about recently is the idea of a data catalog. I wonder if that's coming up in any other discussion. And we see institutions implementing different data catalogs for different purposes. Sometimes it's to try and track all of that data that's being created and deposited in external repositories and having some see. kind of record of that. Gotcha. Um, but in other cases, it's trying to track data perhaps that is licensed by the university by different right. schools, colleges, centers, libraries, and make that discoverable in one place for researchers to see what data they have access to. So I'm curious if that's coming up for you. It is. Um, we have largely talked about that in the context of our institutional repository and the replacement of the institutional repository. So um, many of the products that we're looking at allow us to um, provide a record, and it's not necessarily the catalog. Our catalog is even separate from um, I'm still learning these new library nuances, <laughs> um, being new to the library world. Um, but uh, having the, the record in our institutional repository, whether that data is, st is stored in the repository or whether it's stored in the preservation system, we it's right now it's all a bit vaporware for us because the preservation system that we're looking at does allow us to have things that are, um, you can set policy around it or select restricted access to we're not entirely sure if the repository is at least not consistently across product lines. It depends on what product line we go with there. It may be possible to, to store it in that, but the record would likely be within that. We also, I talked with, I don't know if our GIS librarian is still here or not, our uh, GIS um, research IT person is still here, but um, we talked about GIS data. We are, there are other pockets of data. Um, so for example, there, our Digital Library of Georgia is running on a separate, system. It serves the state, not the University of Georgia, um, but it is run by people who are physically housed in the University of Georgia libraries. Um, they have GIS data as part of their system, their repository, which is separate and an open source product that they had developed or continue to develop on. So there are going to be, pieces, but to your point, there are questions about how do we help people connect between point A and point B. We're wrestling with the same questions. But anything that we purchase that's available to researchers, our intent is either to have it in the preservation solution or the repository. But if you have a catalog, how do you? Uh, and I don't know. I don't know these catalog tools, but but are they set up for the fair data? I mean, you you espouse yeah. the principle of fair data and, and and wanting that metadata and fair data. So or meta, wanting the data and in, 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 the metadata adhering to the fair data principles. So are these catalogs set up for that or are they are they recording different kinds of information? I guess maybe I'm looking at John. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think everyone is approaching it differently. Yes, yeah. that's the thing. There's not a kind of clear. I think if you're a place that's doing it, you're collecting a record. We have we have done um our current repository at one point they started doing the search out to find anybody who is associated with the University of Georgia and bringing that record into um, the repository. From my perspective, that creates, again, I'm coming from an IT's perspective, the libraries folks may feel differently. I think that creates end user confusion because the data and the record, the record exists, but the data does not. And you may or may not have a, an agreement with the, the organization that is hosting the data. So if a person hits a dead end and then you can't get to the data and you have to pay for the data, then they're coming back and asking, can you buy this data for me? That's a real challenge. So. My intention is to start small with what data are we housing here at the University of Georgia, and then let the catalog go send people where they can get it from those external services. We also have um, a product yeah. called Faculty Elements, or it's Symplectic Elements, UGA Elements, um, but they it's Symplectic Elements. That 
piece with the ORCID ID, the persistent identifiers um, that are in the DOI records that are tied to an individual, um, there is an effort to um, have a faculty profile page at the University of Georgia that shows research impact. So as faculty begin publishing their, um, their documents or as they begin publishing their data sets, connecting those DOI records um, to their ORCID ID, back to elements, then you should be able to see a one-stop shop impact for Professor X. Not necessarily catalog, but I hear you on that piece of it. <laughs> I think we're, we are talking about it, but we're also dancing around it because we're still stuck on what data to be able to get the infrastructure in place. So I do have a few things in chat now. Ah, great. Um, Amy Nurnberger, uh, she's posting it uh, in terms of a catalog. There's one example. If y'all want to write this down, you can, or you can go back to the recording. It's at datacatalog.med.nyu.edu. So she's giving one example. And then we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Armand from Purdue says, thank you for the presentation. And this is a long one. So if you want me to come up and show it to you, I will do that. <laughs> Some of the questions we are facing with respect to research data is what it would historically be purely IT, such as how to access data, what arrangements need to be made to transfer data, where should active research data reside, who would address data use agreements or security. These seem to be beyond fair, so wondering how you address those. Yeah, that's a great, that, that's part of the complexity. And when you get into, I'm gonna go back, if you don't mind, to that slide that had the um, this one right here. Um, that talks about the, I call it miscellaneous because it's the miscellaneous data that nobody really wants to deal with, but we still have to deal with it because this is where your NIST standards and CMMC, CMMC uh, requirements come into play. Um, when we look at the policy landscape at other institutions, uh, and, and this is where we're, we're just starting to really dig into it as a council, um, but the, the preliminary data gathering that I've gotten on this front, there seems to be Two different, set, two different approaches. So if you are an institution that is retaining all of the data at your institution, or at least have a record of it, so it comes to you before it goes out to these um, discipline-specific repositories or other organizations, um, there is policy around where that data should live, um, where it should be stored, how it should be secured, how long it will be retained, um, when it, the record becomes tombstoned. So it's discarded and there's a record that it existed once, but it's gone. Um, most institutions seem to continue deferring responsibility to the researcher. Um, so we are providing, uh, Penn State, is, for example, um, has a, a policy that is very explicit in saying, um, well, not a policy, they had a presentation that's talking about uh, they were asking for faculty input on their policy draft. And they were very clear to say up front in their presentation for faculty, we are not trying to tell you where to store the data. We're just trying to help you steward your data um, effectively and securely. So they're providing guidance. The University of Georgia has traditionally played that same role where we're providing guidance to the researchers and where you store it. That doesn't negate the real risks involved in retaining data. So going back to that first research data management committee, you're back to how do you secure your data and how do you protect it from data loss? Um, those issues will still exist. So I think it's a, some of that has to do with your institution's um, institutional culture, the infrastructure that you have in place at your institution and where you want to go as an institution with respect to um, Kind of continuing to um, advance to make it more effective for the the on, ongoing guidance. Did I touch on all the questions that were in that embedded? I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it was all those different examples, and then how would you address those? Um, how we, yeah. So if, with I, regards to fair. In regards to fair. Yeah. So I I will say one of the things that I do really like about the NIH data management and sharing policy. They are, they are not messing around. <laughs> so, for example, if you're dealing with genomic data or you're dealing with, you know, cancer data, for example, they have repositories that are intended to house that data. So they are at least in that particular funding agency, they are at least providing a place for you to store this um, sensitive data. Um, so they that piece of it, you know, when we go back and think about 
what data do we need to retain at the University of Georgia? Do we need to retain this at the institution if that's housed? Maybe, maybe not. We might want to put it here, but we may not want to make it available publicly through our repository. We may not want to move this one up to this category. We may just want to keep it here for the, the duration of the t amount of time that's required for retention at the lab level. Um, but they're very clear about what, how your data should be, um, what data you should be publishing and how you should be publishing it for NIH. I'm hopeful, we won't know until the end of next year, that other funding agencies will follow suit. It does, yeah, and thank you, thank you for that. So does the, and I haven't looked at the NIH data sharing um, um, policy all that, that carefully, but, does it relieve the university of their obligation once somebody deposits in that NIH? Yeah. It does not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So it, it um, they, um, well, now I want to go back and look at it because, because that's a good question. I, I believe there's still an expectation. I have to look at one to, to dig into that one. That's a really good question because I, you know, I think the expectation is that for those dis discipline specific repositories, you're making that available. They're defining how long that will be available, and they're responsible for retaining it at that point because it's part of that fair. Yeah. Yeah. So let me do, let me just follow. NIH or NSF has had a data sharing policy in place since 2011. Nobody talks about it because I think NIH came in and just. <laughs> Put yeah. the teeth in it. Yeah, so everybody just sort of ignores it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's decade the, earlier presence in this field. <laughs> yeah. yeah, NSF is there. The NIH is the one that, that has, um, you know, I think NSF has, I won't say NSF, you're not dealing with the same, but but NIH really has some some parameters when you're dealing with personal health, the, the HIPAA data piece of it. For sure, yeah. for sure, without yeah. question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> without question. Um, <laughs> So we have a couple people online. I've just asked Heather if she would like to unmute. She had her hand raised and I think she was gonna add some comments about NIH. Sure, yeah, thanks Robert. So hi, Heather Coates. I'm a, a data librarian here at IU and the research data steward for IU. Um, we, there's a group of us who've been trying to <laughs> help prepare people for, sorry, I'll move my mic. Um, there's a group of us who have been trying to help prepare researchers um, for the NIH policy, and we've essentially treated retention, sharing, and um, preservation separately because the compliance regs do that to some extent. Um, we don't have a a retention period specified for research data at the institutional level, but it tends to show up in various compliance regs like the common rule for human subjects, animal care and use, et cetera. So um, while we encourage people to share their data, that doesn't absolve them from the, the institutional responsibility to retain the data for whatever period of time um, and it usually is multiple policies that are stacking or uh, absolve them of the preservation responsibility. So it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to convey that though. <laughs> so for us, we've kind of tried to disambiguate that, but it's still a work in progress. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, because I, you know, when you, that's a great way of separating that out because I think those are very, I agree with you. I think they're separate issues. One thing we also didn't talk about in this presentation that you know, I cited it at the very beginning of my presentation, a big component about preservation is also about intellectual property. So at the University of Georgia, we're generating research that is for putting products to market. So there's a real desire to ensure that we have access to things that will become, and those are separate, to your point about separating out the types of um, preservation or types of um, where you are in that, that research data management process, that intellectual property, that's even an additional layer for us, and I'm sure it is here and at other institutions as well, um, that will have expectations for retention um, and where it's saved and how it's accessed and who is allowed to access it and how long it, it needs to be retained. Um, they're trying to, I think there's a desire again to share that openly, but there's also a commercialization component to that as well that's significant. 
Yeah, I'll just add, we, so this came up recently for us um, when the, the NIH updated their FAQ about patent timelines. So they're, they're allowing for a certain delay in um, sharing data so that folk can apply for patents. We have to, we're meeting with our internal folks to understand, is that sufficient? And how do we get through that process? And that's just one piece of the intellectual property puzzle or layer of things. So it, yeah, it's um, the IP conversation is a whole other thread that is hard to disentangle. Yeah, that's a separate, that's also a separate office from the groups. It's part of Office of Research, but they have not engaged with us at all. So that's a group that will be engaged when we get a little further along with our policies at IPG. I have another question. Have you thought about how to efficiently track and enforce data use agreements compliance? Data use agreements, can you, um, can the person, can you all clarify, are you talking about data use on the front end or are you talking about after it's at the end of research? Like, are we talking about the commercialization and intellectual property? Or are we talking about data use? We have, we're accessing someone else's data or we are making access available. Yeah, so I'm thinking about, uh, hi, so I'm Julian. Uh, yes, thinking about the latter case, particularly. The, at the end of the research? Yes, when there are already data sets that are now stored and in order to access that, so people who did not create the data um, but want to access that data, how do you yes. enforce whether they have done HIPAA training or city training, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, so some of that we're hoping, you know, there are some pieces, um, and I, I need to keep going back to NIH, but they do have some of that in place for those um, federal repositories uh, or those, those discipline-specific repositories. Um, that are out there. Um, at the institution level, we're going back, for us, we're talking about policy that's really tied between our institutional repository and research data repository and the preservation system. And it depends on what data we retain. So we, I don't have an example at our institution, but the, the model that we are looking at is it's either going to be stored in the preservation solution and called up to people with our workflow. Um, and we're talking about media flux as kind of that policy layer. Um, we're also talking about whether there's some layers here that could, could service that. Um, but yes, that is a, comp a component. We just haven't gotten that far in our particular um, the, um, part. There are data access. Um, there are existing policies at the University of Georgia, particularly with respect to intellectual property. That's a different office within the Office of Research. So some of those policies exist. And so we would build our workflows around what policy exists. And then we work with the Office of Research to frame our policy around make sure it's complimentary. So there's just a couple of comments and uh, I think we're almost at the end of our time. Uh, Julian, the person who just asked the question said he saw an interesting platform software project at sc23 uh, gen3.org. I heard about that one this morning. I'm eager to go seek that one out. Oh, great. And uh, he says it's uh, used by most, if not all members of the Open uh, Commons Consortium. That's just great. Uh, Jeanette, and then Amy from uh, MIT, who I mentioned earlier, who had the data catalog.med.nyu.edu. She says it's built on the code base provided by the Data Discovery Collaboration, which is at datadiscoverycollaboration.org. Great. Thank you all. I appreciate that. Yeah, I heard about, I think we were talking about the research technology group this morning. Um, so I'm eager to seek that one out as well. Yeah, we're kind of in a mixed spot with respect to um, the, the data, what, it's sort of the, this group in particular, I think, is um, the digital archive space, um, but also the data sharing and data catalog platforms. That's a little, we're still a little, we're still thinking about it largely in this realm, but in the cataloging space, we haven't, we haven't dug into that at this point, just because we're still stuck at what data do we want to keep. And then if we have time for one more, and this is something Indiana University struggles with, uh, this is actually from Tony Walker at IU. What happens to share data when a researcher leaves the university and their account is deleted or disabled. Yeah, so there's a lot of policy, existing policy that is out there um, in the policy landscape. So we um, we have some things, This is our policies right now are really geared around intellectual property. Um, there is a desire to look at that policy from a broader perspective. I think Duke and um, Brown and uh, University of Minnesota, several institutions that we've been looking at have really good policies around um, things that go beyond export control. 
So export control is really, and those are, that's a different category <laughs> of data. Um, but um, generally speaking, um, we are seeing a preference toward the, the data, the institution owns the data, but the researcher that developed that data or generated that data um, is entitled to have access to that data. So um, providing them copies, but from a copyright perspective, the, it is the institution's data is the, that's a trend that we are seeing. No, no, I think we're probably at the end of our time. So. Yeah, well, we have uh, time for if you want to speak with Beth uh, yeah. one on one, you have a few minutes for that, but otherwise, I'll stand up and yep. stretch. Move around and stretch. All right, then thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, online attendees. Thank you.